Welcome to On The Ledge Podcast, the show that puts the culture in horticulture. I am your plant mad host, Jane Perrault, and if I may, here's a random aside. My very first gardening blog, way back in 2004, quite possibly before some of you were born, my God, I feel old, was called Horticulture. Haughty culture. Get it? I know, I know, it, it did seem novel back then. Anyway, it's episode 89 and this week is an on the ledge so along extravaganza. This week we'll be getting to the nitty gritty, the actual seed sowing bit. So my dog Wolfie and I are off to the potting shed to see what's sprouting there. Plus I have special guest Robert Pavlis of website gardenmyths.com to answer a question about using wood ash on houseplants. In case this is all new to you, the On The Ledge Sew Along is incredibly simple. But let me explain. On The Ledge demystifies the art and science of sowing houseplant seeds and you pick what you want to sow, then you sow it and report on your progress via your social media platform of choice, whether that's this podcast, Facebook group, Instagram or Twitter. This year, the meat of the so long is split up into four perfectly digestible chunks of information. In episode 87, we learned where to source seeds. So I hope you've managed to get your mitts on some seeds by now. And in episode 88, we covered what equipment you need. So you should have your seed starting mix and trays all ready to go. But don't worry, if not, there's still plenty of time to get cracking. I'll link to the show notes from the last two weeks in this week's post on my website so you can catch up. This week we're talking about the process of sowing and next week in episode 90 we'll look at what to do once your seeds have germinated and what to do if they don't. I'm delighted to say that some of you have already begun sowing with gusto, so thanks for sharing your progress. Over on the Facebook group, Elaine has sown some mixed cacti, coleus and gerbera, and Lauren has sown monstra seeds. Meanwhile, Ezra is looking for a source of apicia seeds in the US. That's apicia, which I have grown from seed myself. I got mine from the Gesneriad Society, so that's worth a look, Ezra. But if anyone else has any other suggestions of where to get Episcia seeds, also known as the Flame Violet in the US, then do let me know and I'll pass that information on. On Instagram, Linda, who is Leaves for Days KW, had great success sowing a lemon seed, which is now sprouting nicely. And Mark from 30 Days of Wild Parenting has sown agave seeds. Stephanie, aka Essential Botanica, has sown hyssop, jojoba, Joshua Tree and Aloe Africana. And Gen Plants 2 has been catching us up on the progress of the cactus seeds she sowed last year for the sow along, which now look like little baby Pokemon. And this year she's sowing papaya seeds as well as lithops or stone plants from Unusual Seeds in Serbia, the company we recommended in episode 87, who are to be found on Etsy. Marie has been showing off an asparagus fern grown from seed from last year and I know a lot of you are opting to grow Mimosa pudica or the sensitive plant from seed including Alyssa 3660. This plant seems to be so popular everyone seems to love growing it. I guess it's that exciting moment where you can touch the leaves and see them move that makes this so appealing. And finally Naturally Mackie has been sowing Christmas cactus. If you'd like a mention on the show, then do remember to use the hashtag OTL Sew Along. And if you're posting to the Facebook group, add the topic OTL Sew Along, which you can do just under the box where you type. Now, moving swiftly on, it's time for a bit of a botany lesson. As you may know, I'm studying for an RHS qualification, RHS Level 2, and I've been learning about how seeds germinate. So in order to help you learn about what's actually happening with your seeds once you've put them in some soil... And, okay, yes, to help me with my revision, here's a little story about seeds. What happens? 
happens when that seed hits the damp earth? Why does germination begin? Germination is when the seed is kick-started into life and begins to sprout. And there are a few things that are necessary in order for that seed to grow. Water, temperature, and light. Some seeds need sunlight to germinate, others need a lack of sunlight. That's why it's really important before you start sowing that you check the details on the packet that you've got. And if it doesn't indicate whether the seeds need covering, have a little search online and find out exactly what your seed needs. The first step is when the seed starts to imbibe, and that just means take in water. The dry seed actually soaks up water, expands, and that activates the enzymes inside the seed, which will lead to growth. But it's got to be just the right amount of water, too much water, and it's not good for the seed because it also needs oxygen. So if the soil is absolutely soaked and waterlogged, the oxygen just won't be getting through. Temperature is also really important. Again, you need to check what's going on with your particular seed because some seeds really do need tropical temperatures to thrive. Others will germinate at a very cool temperature. Depends on your plant. Generally, house plants tend to come from tropical and subtropical climates, so they'll need something around the 18 to 25 centigrade mark but it's worth checking this before you get started because the wrong temperature can mean your seeds will do absolutely nothing. Once the seed has taken in enough water, the seed coat on the outside that protects the seed while it's waiting to be sown will break open and that's when life really starts. The enzymes that have been activated by the water, they start to work on the stored food that's within the seed and turn those into things that the plant can use to grow. The seed does require oxygen, as I say. This is why you're looking for a nice, porous seed compost that will allow aerobic respiration to start in the seed because this is how it gets its energy until the leaves start to grow and photosynthesis can take over. And now it's off to the potting shed. It's a beautiful spring day, the birds are singing, the dog is pottering about and I am heading off down to the potting shed to do some seed sowing. Why don't you join me? Go on. Okay, let's go in. So I've got quite a few seeds to sow. Let's have a look at what I've got. Well, I've already sown one lot of seeds. That's my Zamia furfuracea, or cardboard palm. These are quite big seeds. They're ooh, the size of a really fat pumpkin seed, I would say. Uh, nothing has happened so far. They've just sat there well, doing absolutely nothing, to be quite frank. So I've had a look at them. I've been curious and impatient, and I have actually taken one seed out, and lo and behold, absolutely nothing had happened to it. And I suspect this is because the seed needs a long time to imbibe. And this is where the seed takes in water, and that starts to get it ready for the germination process. And I suspect that these seeds will come good, but it just takes a long time. So it really depends on the size, shape, and makeup cup of your seed as to how long it will take to grow. What else have I got here? Uh, let's have a look. Um, I've got a lot of seed here, <laughs> as you might be able to tell. So I've got some coleus, um, just a very bog standard packet of mixed coleus, rainbow mix, which I've sown in previous years, a very cheap packet of seed from a UK supermarket slash, well, general store called Wilco. They only cost me a pound, so that was a bargain. I'll be able to get lots of lovely bedding plants over those, some of which I'll overwinter, as I have done this winter. I've also got some Saracenia purpurea, the purple pitcher plant, uh, a really hardy plant that will grow very well outside, probably less of a house plant than more of an outside plant, but it can certainly come inside at certain parts of the year, particularly if you are using grow lights. So I've got those from Chilton Seeds. Also from Chilton Seeds, I've got a, another variety of coleus, extra dwarf formula mixed. So that's some small coleus, which will 
go with my other coleus very nicely. I've got a bargain basement lottery mixture of greenhouse plants. I think some of you have already tried this in previous layers. I'm just going to get the seed out and see what it looks like. I should have to take a photo of this for you, but it's going to look interesting because it's going to show us all the different types of seed that exist. Uh, big, small, many different shapes. Here we go. Let's have a look. Oh, this is so interesting. This is so interesting. I'll take a photo of this for you to have a look at because it just illustrates the huge variance in different kinds of seeds. So some of these seeds are, well, they look very much like a, a sunflower seed or a pumpkin seed, if you can picture that. Then others have a very sort of flaky, um, papery surface and a big and wide. They almost look a bit like sycamore seeds. I have no idea what those are. And we've got some little pointy seeds that shape like a teardrop. And what else have we got? We've got some very flat papery seeds and some hard round seed. Let's pour out a few more and see what else we've got in here. So this could be absolutely anything in here. I'm really excited to sow this mix and see what I get. There's also some seed that look to me a bit like an apple seed. Um, so we will find out as we go what those are. And there's one seed which looks like, well, no, I can't describe it better than a little brown turtle. So gosh, I'm excited to see what this lot turns into. I will let you know. I'm gonna pour them back into the packet for now. And I'm going to see what else I've got here. Let's have a look. Okay, I've got some Cymbalaria malaris. Let me try again. Cymbalaria muralis alba. Now, this is a plant that is called ivy leaf toad flax. It's not a house plant, it's an outside plant, but you could have it inside as uh, over the summer, certainly. And this is a wall growing plant that likes to hang out in cracks and crevices. So I'm gonna try sowing that. That came from a fellow house plant grower. Finally, I've got, well, not finally actually, because I've got some more packets here, but I've got Plectranthus, a mixed pack of Plectranthus from Chilton Seeds. So these are trailing foliage plants, really easy to grow, great for outdoor bedding, but also fantastic house plants in the winter. And then I've got a selection of cacti and succulents. What have I got? These are came, came from my BCSS seed order. That's the British Cactus and Succulent Society. I've got an ag agave utahensis, and I've got Echinophosulo cactus o Oco tyrannius, catchy, Echinopsis obra panda, Echinopsis sylvestris, and Gibeum pubescens. I am really excited about sowing these. And unlike last year, I'm going to make sure that I actually sow them and put good labels on them. Now, while I'm standing here, I just want to share one other thing that happened this week, which blew my mind i uh, you may remember back from the venus flytrap episode that i got some venus flytraps these have been in my unheated potting shed come greenhouse all winter and they're absolutely fine i need to trim a few traps off but they still have some green traps on them if they do die back completely you can find that they come back from nothing um so it's one of those plants that will survive most uh, times in a classic British winter. So if you're in a temperate climate, I uh, provided they've got a little bit of cover, they should be absolutely fine. But what I was really excited about was my Cape Sundews, Drosera Carpensis. Now these I'd been advised would be okay out here with the Venus flytraps, but they looked completely dead. So I was feeling rather sad. And then I looked more closely at the plants and lo and behold, there are tiny, teeny little green shoots of life coming from one, two, three, four, four of the six plants. How exciting is that? So I'll put a picture of this on my show notes, but you can see they are actually growing. So Drosera cabensis are really quite tough. You can keep them indoors and not give them a dormancy period, but they will also be fine going dormant outside here in the unheated greenhouse over winter they're now sitting in a tray of rainwater and doing rather nicely i'm letting my venus flytraps flower this year because well why the heck not i want to see what the flowers look like and it's rather exciting so that is what's going on here 
the agaves that I sewed last on the ledge sew along in 2018 they're doing absolutely fine they've been sat very dry out here for the winter and now they've had their first lot of water and they're starting to spring into life which is rather exciting okay so let's get on with some sewing so what do we need to sew well we need some kind of container i've got these small seed green seed trays which come with their own plastic lid which is rather handy you can of course as we discussed last time use any kind of container that has drainage or that you can put drainage into it doesn't have to be a formal pot um, it's good to reuse stuff so if you've got plastic trays that you can reuse go ahead and do it so i've got my my pot ready hygiene is really important when it comes to sowing seeds if you are going to reuse pots that you've used in the past make sure that they are really clean because you can pass on fungal infections and things that your seedlings will not be happy with so they need to be clean and in fact i'm going to get a different pot because that one is not clean i've obviously failed in my washing on that one let's find another one that actually has been cleaned up reaching back crash bang <laughs> I need to make a pile of pots that need washing clearly well here's one that is nice and clean and I'm going to use this one for my sewing right now so like we discussed last week the seed compost needs to be nice and fresh and I'm using a bag of seed compost that is John Innes based this is a kind of a soil based cotton compost and I'm going to be mixing that with some perlite because I'm going to be sowing these succulent seeds to start with my trusty friend when it comes to sowing seeds is a high tech item that is a washing up bowl <laughs> and I use this to mix my compost mixes in just going to move this Aloe Aristata, which has been living out here, one of my oldest and most precious plants. I'm just going to move him out of the way because I need some space for this. Um, so I'm going to get my John Innes number two, as we discussed, as discussed, sorry, not John Innes number two, John Innes seed sowing compost. As we discussed last time, this is really quite fine, and that's what makes it good for seed sowing. No big lumps that are going to interrupt the seeds as they try to germinate now i'm going to add some water to this because if you wait till after you've sown to add water you'll find that your seeds end up on a mad floating journey around the pot and get totally displaced so i'm going to go and pause this while i go and get some water which will then go into this mix and moisten it before I start. I'm not going to use rainwater, I'm going to use tap water because again, rainwater can introduce things that might cause damping off, a condition that's caused by fungus and causes seedlings to fail. So I'll be back shortly, I'm just going to go and get some water. Hi, I'm back. So, Oftentimes people ask, oh, what's the recipe for this mix or the, that mix? And the trouble is, is that I do this kind of thing by eye. Roughly, I would say it's about, for cacti and succulents, you want to add two parts compost to one part perlite, or two parts compost to two parts perlite. Uh, you want it to be free draining. So imagine how water's gonna pass through that mass and is it going to pass through easily in a way for seeds I will not want to say you can't add too much in the way of um, drainage material but you're aiming roughly for I'd say 60 40 to 50 50 on your compost versus drainage material mix be that perlite or horticultural sand or similar there's so a few lumpy bits in here for some reason, so I'm going to remove those and make sure they don't cause a problem. This mix goes into my seed tray. And you can buy fancy tamping devices, 
but you know what my hands are the best tampers in the world because they can really feel what's going on with the compost and how solidified it is so I'm going to tamp that down it's nice and moist already and it's ready to be sown and I'm going to go for some of my agave seeds first so this is agave utahensis from Meadview, Arizona. How exciting. And the, the seeds of agaves are little black, not quite discs, quite easy to see. So these don't need a lot of effort in terms of sowing. They can just be very gently added to the surface of the compost, nicely spread out. I've only got about eight to ten seeds here, so it shouldn't be a problem to make sure they're spread out nicely. Let's open the seed packet, make sure I've got them all. Okay, they're all in. Now, topping this, I'm going to top this with a little bit of vermiculite. Now, as we know, vermiculite is lightweight material, which is great for topping seed mixes. It won't stop the seeds from coming through. It'll just add a little layer of covering. Excuse me. Right, so my seeds are sown and they're covered with a small layer of vermiculite. When you're covering seeds, the rule is that the seeds should be covered with material as deep as the seeds themselves, if the seeds require light to be excluded for germination. And this is worth checking because some seeds need light for germination, other seeds don't need light. I'm going to just press that down gently. The compost is already watered. And now we're at the final stage of the game where I do a proper label. And in fact, you know what? I'm going to go crazy this year and I'm going to write it out properly because last year I had all kinds of trouble with my terrible seed naming lack of care. And so this year I'm going to be really careful and make sure that I know which is which. So this is agave. And I'm going to write the date on there as well, so I know when it was sown. The lid gets popped on here. Usually these little things have two options on the lid. You have a vent that opens and closes. When the seed is yet to germinate, I think it's best to keep the, lid cl the vent closed because that encourages heat once the cacti have or succulents have germinated then you can introduce a bit of air into the container by opening that vent a little bit. So now I'm going to sow some really really tiny seed just to show you how that's done. This is the seed of Gibeum pubescens subspecies Shandii. I have no idea what that looks like. Once I've done this I'm going to have to go and look at what the seed is but here we go. Let's pop this in some soil and the key with this one is to remember that this seed is like dust so you are going to struggle to sow it if you just try and get it straight out of the packet and sow it it won't go smoothly i guarantee you so now that i've got my seed tray filled with my pre-prepared moist stuff i'm just going to go and get some horticultural silver sand uh, i think this is quite hard to get hold of in the us i think i did put a le link in last week's show notes so this is great because it does not contain tons of lime. You'll find that builder sand and a lot of regular sand will contain a lot of lime which plants hate. Horticultural silver sand does not contain that so you know that you're going to be okay putting it on your plants. So I've grabbed a handful of this and I'm just going to get another little container as a mixing bowl for my silver sand and my seeds. This tiny plant pot will do. I'm opening the seed packet and I'm going to try to mix in these tiny dusty seeds with the silver sand and then sow the whole lot on the surface of the soil. These are like tiny orange pinpricks, these seeds. They really are minuscule. So there's no way I'd be able to spread them out evenly, but with the silver sand mixed in, it makes the job a heck of a lot easier. Right, in you go, seed. Where's the dog gone? 
Hang on, just gonna check where the dog is. Hang on a sec. Wolfie! Wolfie! Oh, there you are. Oh, okay. You right, Wolf? Good boy. Good dog. Okay, Wolfie's fine. Right, back to the seed sowing. So, I'm gonna give that a mix around with my finger and then it's gonna go on the surface of the compost evenly. And somewhere in that silver sand will be my seeds. And provided I get it all out and spread it evenly over the surface, that will mean that the seeds will be in there. I don't need to put anything else on top because they're part of the silver sand already. And they've got that topping. And that should mean that I get nice even germination from my seeds. Remember, these cactus and succulent seeds are likely to stay in this tray for a really long time. In fact, last year's some of last year's seeds are still in that tray needing to be pricked out by me because I haven't got around to that job yet. So that's worth bearing in mind that you need to sow them relatively thinly so that they can sit in that tray for a long time before they get moved. So here we go, I'm gonna write my label. You can use a permanent pen like a Sharpie type pen or a pencil. Remember to write clearly, I have terrible handwriting. So that is how we do it. It sounds really obvious, but do read the instructions. Seeds have different needs, and so it's really important to read the instructions and not assume that you know what you're doing with a particular seed. This is key. I know sometimes I think I know what I'm doing and then realize in horror that I don't. So there we go, I've got two lots of my seeds sewn up, lots more to do. Whatever you end up sowing, you'll find that it's an incredibly satisfying process. And at the end of it, you've then got the exciting waiting game for your seed to germinate. So hang on in there, on the ledge listeners, and enjoy the ride as you wait for your seedlings to germinate. update on my attempt to get 200 patrons in time for my 100th episode in June. It's going very well so far. Welcome to Amanda, Jasmine and Shona who have recently become crazy plant people. And Kathy, Robin, Katie, Pam, Aris, Patricia and Paul have all become legends. Thanks to all of you for putting your faith in on the ledge. And do I think that there's another 90 of you out there who are willing to donate a dollar or more a month towards the show? Well, yes, I do, actually. Thousands of you are listening every week. And so I think there are at least 90 people out there who would be prepared to commit to donating to the show every month. So get your finger out, get clicking and sign up to Patreon. Not only will you get a beautiful digital artwork by listener Nathaniel Oles, you'll also get a shout out in my 100th episode too, and the chance to have a say about what goes into that very special anniversary episode. So visit janeperone.com to find out how to go about becoming part of this very important and exclusive On The Ledge patron community. If you're worried about the fact that it's in dollars and you don't live in the US, don't worry about it. You can either pay with PayPal every month or your credit or debit card. I'm also introducing a $10 tier this month and members of the $10 tier will get the chance to become part of On The Ledge's listener panel and shape the future of the show. So if you're interested in that tier, stay tuned for more details soon. And the Facebook Live will be taking place on Thursday, the 11th of April from 8.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. UK time. So do join me then. That Facebook Live is in celebration of reaching my goal of 100 patrons. And I'm going to be talking about all kinds of interesting stuff. So do tune in for that. Facebook Live, 11th of April, 8.30 p.m. UK time. In other news, I am doing a talk on the magic of houseplants. You know, abracaladium, or maybe alakazurabra. 
you know, that sort of thing, at the Highgate Scientific and Literary Institute in London on the evening of April the 9th. It's free to come. So if you are in the London area, do come along and meet me. Uh, Let me know in advance if you're coming and I shall bring a little bit of OTL merch just for you. Details in the show notes. Now it's time for question of the week. And Peter emailed me with this question. I've got bags full of wood ash from my wood burning stove and I'm wondering what to do with it and what not to do with it, of course. I'm sure it must be useful in some way. Can you please advise? Thanks for your question, Peter. There's a lot of misinformation out there about the use of wood ash in gardening, so I wanted to get a really expert opinion on this one. I asked Robert Pavlis, the gardening expert behind the website GardenMist.com, to help me out. Here's what he had to say. Okay, so what I do with a question like this is I I go and try and understand what wood ash really is, and then from there decide whether or not you want to use it for plants. So wood ash, if we label it as a fertilizer, would be a 0-1-3. So it has no nitrogen, um, has a little phosphorus and some potassium. So as a general fertilizer, it's not going to be very good because the thing plants need most of is nitrogen. So if you did use it, you'd, you'd have to supplement it with certainly nitrogen. The, the phosphorus and potassium levels aren't bad, but you'd have to add some additional nitrogen. If you just tried to use wood ash on your plants, uh, it's not going to help them grow. The other thing it has is about 20% calcium, uh, which is actually pretty high. And that will create a lot of salt issues, particularly in a potted plant. So here we have very hard water. And our natural tap water has uh, lots of calcium in it and magnesium. And uh, we have to be very careful that we don't let the water evaporate too much in pots. So when we water house plants, we we, uh, try to get water to go through the pot to wash the salts out. So wood ash is going to provide quite a bit of salts. Um, and, And the word salts, by the way, has two different meanings. So the general public consider salt to be table salt, which is sodium chloride. But a chemist um, uses a different term for salt. And so any of these calcium uh, phosphates and so on would all be salts. The next thing I look at is the pH. So wood ash is going to have a pH based on um, where what kind of wood you use, but it generally is in the order of a pH 10 which is really alkaline, and it, it, most plants want to be under 7, right? So the, the sweet spot for plants is somewhere in the 6 to 7 range or 5.5 to 7 range, something like that. So now you're going to take something that has a pH of 10 and, and put it on your house plants, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So, so the answer, I think, is, is I wouldn't use it uh, on house plants. Um, even in the garden, if your soil is acidic, then okay, some wood ash is probably good for it. But if uh, you're like me and your your natural soil is alkaline, then the last thing you need is is more alkaline material put on your garden. So uh, I would say you can use wood ash in places that have a lower pH or that are acidic, and you're trying to bring the pH up. Um, Other than that, it probably is not good for plants. Is there an argument for putting it on your compost heap as a way of, well, doing something with it rather than putting it into landfill, but not doing, putting it, not putting it on the garden, but putting it straight into your heap where it'll then mix up with everything else and, and not do any, any harm, but not end up in landfill. Yeah. So in the, in the compost, pile it's it would be the same as putting it on on your garden soil so whether you put it in compost and then move it to your garden or put it directly in the garden there's really no difference Uh, a small amount is going to add a few nutrients if you actually look at um, the the other nutrients in wood ash it actually has quite a few of the micronutrients and i actually have a table of that in my garden myths book uh, where I, I list all the nutrients. So there are nutrients in there. Uh, it's really a pH issue. Um, 
as long as you're okay with adding some more alkaline material to your garden, it's it's fine. But it, it doesn't change whether you put it directly on the soil or in a compost pile. And people have, I think, a misguided understanding of what composting is. Because the, the way I compost is I just throw everything right in the garden. I don't bother building a, a pile and turning it and so on. And from a chemical point of view and from the plant's perspective, there's no difference whether you build a pile and then spread it around or you just throw the stuff on the garden. At some point, the nutrients get released and they're made available to the plants. Um, composting might speed up that process a little bit. Um, but on the other hand, you also lose things in a compost pile. So as you're composting, you lose some of the nitrogen. You probably lose less nitrogen if you just throw it on the ground and, and let the dew worms take care of it. Well, you've, you've kind of uh, harshed my mellow there, Robert, because I love my compost heap. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> I know what you mean. I mean, I think you're right that l lots of mulching uh, of uh, leaving, cutting things down and leaving them where they lie as mulch uh, is a is a it's very labour saving, isn't it? So uh, I think I uh, hopefully there's a room for a bit of both because I do love my compost heap. I find it uh, it's it's a moving meditation turning the compost heap. So uh, perhaps it's just for my mental health rather than for my garden's health that I compost. <laughs> Well, I, I used to compost a lot, and I think it's a great idea. Um, I, I stop mostly because of the space I have now. It's just too much work carrying it around and spreading it around as much faster just to leave it where it is. Uh, so composting is really good. Um, I don't have any, any problem with it. And the material then can be spread where, where you need it. Um, as long as you put it back in the garden, it's fine. I hope you found that useful, Peter. And any legends out there, that's my $5 or more subscribers on Patreon, there's a much longer interview with Robert available on my Patreon feed right now in an extra leaf number 25, including Robert's thoughts on houseplant fertiliser. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge, I want to hear it. Drop me a line at ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com. I had such a lovely walk in the countryside this morning with my cinnamon trust dog, Bonnie, that I wanted to share with you some of the wonderful sounds. So I'm ending the show with that and I'll be back next week with part four of the On The Ledge Sew Along and more. all for this week's On The Ledge podcast just remember sometimes much as we love our indoor plants it's great to get outside too see you next week bye the music you heard in this week's episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops Quasi Motion by Kevin MacLeod and An Instrument the Boy Called Happy Day Gukana by Samuel Corwin. All licensed under Creative Commons. See janeperone.com for details.